Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the live panel discussion or integrating innovative innovation frameworks into education conducted by APER in collaboration with Intelligence Plus. Before we dive into today's panel discussion, I would like to introduce APER and Intelligence Plus. The Association for Primary Education and Research established by the Early Childhood Association aims to bring together all stakeholders involved in education of children from six to 10 years, ensuring a smooth transition and lifelong success for all children. Our goal is to ensure that every primary uh, school teacher in our country gets access to the, uh, to the latest research, training and publications to create uh, stress-free classrooms. For more information and to become a member, please visit www.eca-aper.org. Intelligence Plus is a, a pointer education startup creating unique programs and products fo uh, focused on developing 21st century skills and entrepreneurship. Education in children in the age group uh, K to 12 segment based on best practices and well-researched uh, pediology they believe they believe in creating the future of learning that can prepare people for real life while making it fun and hand on which can have a profound impact in which the young generation is growing they are a young and enthusiastic team and work with organization pan india today's panel discussion is on integrating innovation framework into education our moderator for this discussion is Ms. Pranjal Jain, founder and co uh, and CEO of Intelligence Plus. Ms. Pranjal, I would request you to please introduce the panelist and take this discussion forward. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, a very good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all our eminent panelists and the audience listening to this, joining us live today. Uh, welcome to our important session on integrating innovation frameworks in schools, especially at the classroom level. And uh, I, Pranjal Jain Vandesha, as the founder CEO of Intelligence Plus and InnoVenture, India's largest ideation and innovation challenge for school children. Uh, we're delighted that we'll focus today's discussion on integrating specific innovation tools and skills, as well as its implication, not just with reference with the new education policy, but also its impact in students' learning uh, for the future. And uh, for this, we're honored to have some of the most prominent school leaders and edu leaders in the country. Uh, we have Mrs. Prasanna Dodawala, the Vice President of ECA APER and the Executive Chairperson of Crimson Education and the Group of Schools. We also have Mrs. Azma Zaidi, the APER Treasury Head for Jammu and Kashmir and Telangana and the Founder Director of the Let's Read Program. And of course, we have Mr. Jasveer Singh Parmar, who's the principal of Macro Vision School Academy, Buranpur, Madhya Pradesh. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're uh, indeed delighted and honored to have all of you all. So let's begin with today's panel discussion with certain poignant questions, uh, which I'd love thank to ask. Thank you so much, Pranjan. Sorry, uh, did I miss something? Okay, let's deep dive into the panel discussion straight away and uh, let's hear all our panelists' viewpoints on all uh, on their understanding and insights from these. And I'd love if you can share specific case studies, tools and frameworks from your classroom. But before we set the stage, I would love to know from each of you, what does innovation mean in the context of education and why it's crucial to integrate that at the classroom level. Uh, we'd love to start from Farzana, ma'am. Oh, lovely. So good afternoon to everyone. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel and have Pranjal as our moderator. So, uh, you know, innovation. When you think of that word, you know, immediately what comes to our mind is innovate to educate. We have to, as educators, bring about innovation in our classrooms 
And how will we do that? We should develop those essential skills, not only in our students. Every time we say we should do this for our children, and but it should also be with our teachers. So it is a two-way street. And if we can get creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, adaptability, risk-taking, I think we can definitely find innovative solutions to complex problems and get our kids future ready. Over to you, Pranj. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, Jasveer, sir. Of, uh, sorry, we, okay, we could begin with Asma, ma'am. Sorry, I missed your hand. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as ma'am rightly said, it's uh, innovation should be not just for the students, but also for the teachers. And uh, I think times have really changed. And, uh, you know, the age-old method of... Uh, textbook learning and whatever is the content that is given to schools and to children, I think it doesn't apply to most of the schools and to learners now, because I think the whole idea of education has changed. It's not the transfer of knowledge anymore, right? I think all the knowledge is in your phones. So the, the whole idea for education and why children used to go to a school has changed. So now children don't really go to a school to get to gain knowledge. Now children are in schools for very different reasons. And that is why uh, I think schools really uh, have to focus on culturally responsive learning, you know? So, because different places, I travel a lot and I see that the need for the children and schools and teachers in Kargil, for example, is very different from the need of children living in Lucknow is very different from need of children living in Hyderabad and those living in Kerala. So like the exposure that they have, the place that they are situated in, the geographical location, the resources that are available to the school, I think all these things really make a huge difference uh, in the way education is delivered and definitely calls for why innovation is needed. Because, uh, because I think uh, now in this day and age, you cannot do with textbooks. Uh, you need, the school needs and education needs much more. If you want to have creative uh, thinking, if you want to have critical thinking, if you have to solve problems and get children, uh, you know, and teachers, uh, the ability to guide the students, the facilitators also need that ability to guide the students for problem solving and critical thinking. It's, you really need innovation. You can't do without it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, ma'am, to bring in that perspective of how geographical, uh, you know, diversity can affect and the need for that more so in today's time. Uh, over to you, Jasveer, sir. Yeah, uh, all is well to all of you. Uh, you must be wondering the, uh, why I use the salutation that all is well. Actually, this it's a greeting which we use in our school. Our students are also using the same greeting, even the staff also. And when we talk about the innovation, how the idea develops. Now, we are having the hospital, the multi-speciality hospital. And the name of the hospital is uh, All Is Well. Now, we wanted to just give the information to the people that, uh, okay, yes, we are having the uh, hospital with such name. So, when we were having the discussion, so from the discussion only, this word came, okay, All Is Well. I think from one Three Idiots movie, that one song is there. So, right. we thought that, okay, yes, it's a good one. It's a good idea. And when we say the All Is Well, that means everything is fine, fine with you, fine with me, even the surrounding, even the environment, everything is uh, all, uh, we can say the all good. So when we talk about the innovation and all, the thing, the most important thing is the idea, the development of the idea. Another example which would, I would like to give of my school, the dining hall of my school, the name of the dining hall is the Swat Sunset. Okay, Sunset, we all know the parliament, Swat, it's a taste. Now, as we are having the students in hostel, also nearly 2,200 students are in hostel. They are from the different parts of the uh, country. So they are come and belonging to the different religion, different castes from different communities. All are coming together and having the meal. So when we have given the name to our different beings, the purpose the behind uh, was that the, at least the students, they should start thinking on that. And when they start thinking on the words and all, then definitely the new ideas uh, will come. Of course, what my what Ma'am has earlier said about the 21st uh, century skills, about the critical thinking, and how the critical thinking will 
be developed. And what I feel that it's the reading part. Because nowadays the students, they have lost the habit of reading. They are not uh, uh, reading it. So we have come up with that idea also that, okay, yes, in the assembly, and we have made it mandatory that, okay, every month or in a month or two, you have to complete one year to read one uh, novel or one uh, book of your liking. And then you have to represent it in the morning assembly. You have to share it with the others. Then the discussion goes on and like that the, the even the classroom also gets uh, interesting. The students also starts getting some idea and they are able to solve the problems also. So this is what actually we are doing in our uh, school. Like this is what I feel. That is the innovation. Innovation not only means that, okay, just uh, coming up with this, uh, some, uh, you can say, uh, some gadgets and all. It's beyond that. And because we have to develop oh, this right. global students, actually, we have to develop them. We have to uh, make students aware that beyond success, beyond academics, you have to think. Okay, Because nowadays, the students, they are more focused on the academics rather than that what beyond academics. There are so many fields out there. So how they will come to know? These are the certain small, small things which we are uh, doing in our uh, school. And this is what I feel. Thank you so much uh, for sharing such, uh, you know, relevant examples directly to start off the conversation. So I'm going to uh, move into sharing and understanding some specific examples of innovation frameworks and techniques. For very long, the Indian education system spoke about innovative pedagogies, but it's not, it's time that we not just discuss innovative pedagogies, but uh, like just research said to bring it, take it ahead. How do you work on the development of an idea, right? Is coming up with ideas just by chance or can it be developed as a process uh, by choice? And so I would love to understand from you who would like to take it ahead with certain specific examples, tools or techniques that are successfully used in the classrooms and the impact that they have had. So Pranjal, um, I would love all of you all to just imagine a very tedious class. You're a student here, right? All of you watching us, Imagine yourself, you're in a class and, you know, you're just hearing the drone of the teacher's voices echoing in your ears. You're struggling, you know, as students, we have seen it so often that the students are struggling from falling asleep and you're trying to complete your syllabus. Now, is that an ideal classroom, friends? No. So I would not only blame my children and students for it that they are not paying attention, they are feeling sleepy, drowsy, because it is also the teacher's shared responsibility to not deliver monotonous lessons, you know, where the students are so disinterested. So I would, I would really suggest we should think of strategies and innovations which would bring about, you know, a connect to the real world. Now, let me give you an example of connect to the real world. Uh, for example, uh, we do uh, something called um, a lot of field visits. Most of us do field visits, okay? Why do we do field visits? That field visits is connecting the theory that you learn in the class with actually. If you only teach, as Asma said very rightly, textbooks are not absolute. So if you are only teaching through a textbook and giving yarn, we'll have that droopy eye classroom. But if the teacher is taking them on a field visit, for example, farm to table, so I teach them how the food is being produced and how it reaches you. And that's a very common topic in EVS in most of our primary schools. But do we do that way or just we talk about it as a theory? Another very interesting thing that we do in our school is take them on supermarket visits, you know, when we're talking about healthy eating in the same unit. So we get them uh, what we do, friends, is we get the, ask the children to bring any food empty packets to school first. And we teach them how to read the labels. And then when we take them to a supermarket and say, okay, you have so much money, buy something which is nutritious and it is yummy and tasty for you. And that's when they learn. So this is bringing, not only talking about calories and nutrition as a theory, but bringing them and getting them to stop things, start learning to read food labels and understand. You know, so that's how you connect to the real. Another good example, which I would love to share, is the cultivation of soft skills. 
know, this is so important in today's world to get our children's future ready. You know, and what are these soft skills? Communication, collaboration, time management, things like that. So how would we cultivate and what do we do in our school? We had something called a grooming curriculum where we teach them these soft skills of how to talk, how to walk, how to present. See, it may look a very minute thing, but that is a life skill. Because when our children are walking into an interview in an office, they know exactly what to say and how to do it. We do another thing which is called podcasting. And we got some famous podcaster to come and do some guest lectures with our children. It worked wonders. Today, that communication skill and the way they talk is really amazing. So it's, it's a step-up approach, friends. I know we can't do everything from 0 to 100. But let's take the first baby steps and bring small innovations in the way we teach and learn. And hopefully it should help. Last point before I give it off to the other person. We have something, you know, we always talk about feedback, feedback, feedback. In our schools, we call it feed forward. Now, what, I, what do you mean by feed forward? Is, of course, when children are doing some project, we give them a, a feedback, which is to help them improve what they are doing. So what will they improve in future? Similarly, even if a teacher, as I said, it's a two-way street. I can't only tell my student to do things, but also my teacher. And what do we do with the teacher? When we observe her class, when she comes back to us, we give her the feed forward to tell her two good things that have happened in her class and two things which she could improve upon. So never negative. We never use a negative either in the classroom or with our teachers or even with our parents. It's always a positive note. You know, and we all know what is the power of it. And that's exactly what I meant. Use the power of it in your classroom. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing, you know, the experiential processes that you're trying to use to bring alive the classroom. Uh, Asana, ma'am, I'd love to understand from you any specific uh, innovation processes or tools that have been used for idea generation? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and different for different spaces. So, for example, uh, uh, um, the few schools that I know, uh, gamification and inquiry-based learning would work really well with the students over there because uh, they have access to technology. But some places that I go to, uh, they don't have access to technology. So, innovations like inquiry-based learning and gamification and these, uh, you know, uh, using... Uh, uh, using apps or using uh, innovative technology would not work in those schools because they don't have access to them. So in those places, you can have project-based researches. You can have experiential sessions. You can do nature pedagogy uh, and use it in different ways. One of the very interesting things that I just recollected, like yesterday, I'm like I said, I'm here in Pune and uh, I'm at Pana Communities. And uh, uh, I witnessed something really amazing uh, by making short films. So children showcase their learning, and I thought it was really innovative, uh, showcase their learning by making short uh, films, very short films, maybe like two, three minutes, uh, using their mobile phones. So we are always asking children to stay away from phones, but what if we use the power of the phones, uh, you know, to uh, as an innovation strategy to showcase learning? Right. So uh, there are many different things that you can do according to the situation that you are in within the schools. Uh, but um, and I think it lies on the ability and creativity of the teacher to use uh, different pedagogies to their advantage according to the situation that they're in. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, just please, sir, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I would like to add on what uh, Farzana Ma'am has said about the interest, how to make the classroom interesting and all. Now, what we are doing in the classroom, that if the science teacher if, uh, is teaching related to the teeth, about the jaws and about the teeth and all, what the students are doing, they are making the uh, model with the help of the clay. Then if they come to know that, okay, yes, these are the type of the teeth and the name of the teeth and all, even if they are going with the digestive system, so they are making the model. And many a time, the students coming up with the character, like suppose the stomach, so the student will play the role of a stomach 
and you will say that what is the utility, how the stomach uh, uh, work. And like that, the classroom, it becomes uh, somewhat um, interesting uh, also. We are now, we have, we have studied about the flipped classroom, giving a topic to the students, preparing it at home, and solving the questions in the classroom with the help of a teacher or with the help of a uh, peers. So that also we are doing it. Ma'am has talked about the time that we, yes, of course, we have to teach when we talk about the soft skill time also plays a very important uh, role. And uh, you will be surprised to know that whenever we are having any of the event in our school, we never garland any statue or idol or the photograph and all. We garland a very big clock we are having it because we feel that the time is our God. And we start sharp. If we have given that, okay, at six in the evening, the program will start. It will start at six. If it's going to end at nine, it will sharp at nine, it will end. No, like that the small kids also, they are learning, they are understanding that, okay, yes, we have to value the time. And you will be surprised to know in our school, we never give the uh, batches for the 100% attendance because we never face the problem of the attendance. Because the students, very much, they are very much eager to come. They know the value of the uh, time. They know the value of the classroom and the way the interesting, we are making the classroom interesting. It's something very, uh, you can say, uh, a, a good one. The students are uh, lacking that one. Our students, they are having the iPads. So many of them, they are making, making the iMovies also. We give them the topic. Maybe the uh, topic related to the academics, topic related to any other activities and all. So they make the small iMovies also. They do their all their creations. Even they uh, come up with the, uh, you can say, some uh, animations uh, also. And through the animation, they are uh, teaching when whenever they go for a peer teaching. So they use that uh, in their classroom. And all these things, um, definitely, it's making the classroom very uh, interesting. And one more thing, generally, we say that it's a work of a teacher and a student. But we have involved the parents also in these uh, activities. We are taking the help of the parents also. We have means we are developing even the bond between the parent and the uh, child. We are convinced that okay, the, the parents when they play, when they come in the classroom to teach, parents as a teacher, we are arranging a week, full week we dedicate to the parents. So parents, they give the topic that okay, this topic I will be coming and teaching in the class. So they come in the class, they are teaching in the class. So they are developing that uh, bond also. We arrange the assembly for the parents. The parents, they come, they perform. And uh, last year we had a um, uh, annual function of the parents, which performed and organized by the parents uh, themselves. With and that definitely their children were also their kids were uh, with them. So like that soft skill also means that we are developing uh, that one. And all these things is uh, having a very good impact on the students. When we talk about the healthy uh, food and all, what Mama said that okay, carrying the paper in the supermarket that pouch um, packet and all, and thinking that nutrition values and all. So what we have done, we have given the uh, break, food break we have given. And we have made it mandatory, especially for the small children, because we say, catch them at younger. So the small kids right from class one to class eight, it's mandatory for the children to bring whatever the nuts they are having it. It could be um, peanut, it could be um, almonds, whatever, what, or the, even the sprouts also. It's mandatory for them to bring it. Have a whenever they are having the break, uh, this uh, food break, they have to uh, take one, uh, take uh, those um, uh, fruits which they have brought with them. So, like uh, in that way, they they come to know that okay, yes, we have to go for the healthy food also instead of going running after the junk food and all. But to some extent, yes, we are able to pass on this uh, message about the healthy food, healthy good uh, health, uh, eating. Uh, Habits also. What to eat is most um, uh, mm -hmm. important. So like these small, small things we are doing in the school and uh, it is definitely it's helping us out. It's helping us yeah. out. Wonderful. So thank you for sharing the experiential um, aspects to make learning more relevant, more project-based, more hands-on. I'd love to share an example. Uh, and I think this is slightly different, but it will really add to the whole uh, experience. So we work with a few schools and uh, one of the other concerns or topics that we see is that when children are given projects, they essentially know the topic. But we're going to be in a world where children have to create solutions for problems that don't exist today, for topics that not they're really prepared for. So in one of the, uh, and if they especially have to be innovators and thinkers, 
they have to look for opportunities or problems. So in one of the uh, sessions, uh, we asked children to come up with ideas that could help senior citizens. And for about 20 minutes, there were some very odd ideas, but there wasn't really any solution of what should we really create. And then we said, okay, let's do a very simple technique called the bar key. And the bar key is an acronym for, you know, B, make it bigger in size, impact scale. A is for add a feature or R is for remove, replace something. And we took a walker in front of them and say, okay, now this is a walker you've seen all of your grandparents, maybe you or senior citizens around them. Now use the bar key to come up with new ideas and let's go into rapid prototyping mode. And that's where they started, okay, maybe we could make it height adjustable. Maybe we could replace this. Oh, our walkers don't have a mobile holder. They don't have an emergency button in case they fall down. They don't have, um, you know, um, neon colors because if they're going out for an evening walk and someone doesn't see them, uh, you know, in the dark. So all of these ideas came in because they were introduced to a technique. And then they said, okay, using this technique, now we know how to create, you know, a large number of ideas. And that's when they said, okay, now we can really innovate. We can use our uh, utter tinkering labs to now create something. We can use these softwares to create something. So I think, uh, you know, along with experiential learning, these tools and techniques can really uh, refine a child's way to come up with ideas uh, that can help them. So uh, it, it was wonderful understanding all these case studies now. Uh, moving ahead, you know, I would love to understand- You're so bang on, Pranjal. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sorry, I just wanted to appreciate it and say you're so bang on because uh, a lot of children in IB and affluent schools uh, do not have, uh, when you ask them to look for problems around them, uh, they have such cushioned lives that they don't see the problems. And sometimes you really need to break it for them and help give them these tools to actually come up with solutions for things which are in front of them, but they don't really look at it as a problem. So yeah. a very good one, Pranjal. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving ahead, you know, uh, we'd love to understand, uh, you know, so the new NEP, the NCA, all of them talks about not just innovative pedagogies. We spoke about innovative pedagogies and experiential learning. We've been speaking about this for a long time. And of course, we've innovated so much in our classrooms from the chalk and talk to where, where we are now. Um, and in one of the earlier panels, there was a very important discussion on unless we um, align our learnings, our tools to so the, end, the new uh, education policy talks about design thinking and teaching innovation as a, you know, as a practice, as a process. Uh, I would want to understand how are we putting that and aligning that into our curriculums? Like someone said, from the assessment point, if it doesn't come in somewhere in the assessments, because finally that's what parents will value and see, to someone talking about making those innovation practices visible in the school. I'd love to have insights from you all of, how are we integrating, uh, you know, these uh, processes, practice skills with the guidelines or in the framework of the NEP or actually in a way reverse, trying to make the NEP, you know, really come alive in our classrooms, <laughs> right? Okay. Yes, so we begin from anyone who's willing to take it first. Okay, can I? Yes, sure, Karjana. Okay, so, uh, when we talk about the different things, Generally, the parents, as you have said, uh, they start thinking about the assessment, mm -hmm. okay? And from there, only the pressure starts, what I uh, feel. So <clears throat> what we are uh, doing, we are introducing all the things. We are having the AI, or we have introduced the AI also. We have we are having, the students are doing the coding also. They are learning the different skills also, as I have told, that as the students are having the iPad, so they are just um, uh, using the iPad, they are making the iMovie, they are even um, uh, creating their own uh, comics, everything they are doing it. But we are not keeping it as a part of the uh, assessment because we want, see, if we put it in the assessment, then the, all the pressure, the students also start uh, taking the pressure. We want that, okay, they should learn it. It should come from their heart. They should enjoy uh, that way. So we are uh, doing in uh, that way. Definitely the students are enjoying it. And even the cooking also, you will be surprised to know that the boys are more interested to learn how to uh, cook. So we are arranging every now and then we are having the session um, 
uh, in our school for the uh, boys. So our chef and all, we are having the restaurant also. So they come and they teach uh, um, the very small, small things to the uh, to students that how without the fire and whatever the ingredients which you are having, how to make uh, the food. So these are the things which we are just uh, uh, doing it, and we should give the open, uh, we should give the freedom to the uh, to children. Okay. Because whatever the innovation is there, whatever the things which you did, unless and until they will not get the freedom, perhaps they will not come up with the uh, idea, with the new things. I would like to give the example, two of our students, regularly they are attending the APIL yearly annual event at uh, in uh, US, the WWDC, they are having the event every year for the World, uh, World Web Developer Conference. And uh, two of our students now, they are the uh, alumni of the, uh, our school. They were very much average in their, um, if I talk about the academics and not very average. Okay? But they were very much techno uh, friendly and um, they are um, expert in the coding and all. And then now the thing is that every year the uh, Apple company, they are sponsoring them. They are attending that uh, conference. They are coming with the new ideas. What they have done, what we have done, we have given them some freedom. That, okay, yes, come on, let's do it. You are interested in that one? Come on, go to the uh, lab. Do whatever uh, you wish. But it should be in a framework. It should be in a limit, it should not be uh, misused. The technology should not be uh, misused. So that freedom is required for um, the things because assessment definitely is. Again, I will repeat the student, the parents, not the, uh, only the uh, children, but even the parents, they, they take more stress than the children. Then they start thinking hey, that, okay, now something we have to do, whether my child will be doing it well or not. So things they start looking for, let the let freedom be given to the uh, children. And definitely they will, what we will not be able to imagine, perhaps they will come up with those uh, ideas. This is what I think. Absolutely. Yes, Asma, ma'am. Um, I absolutely agree with what sir has said. And uh, um, so what we do in my school is that uh, during the parent orientation programs, uh, we explain to the parents the different kind of uh, formative assessments that are used to uh, assess the learning for children. And they might not be the regular paper pencil test. Uh, and this is what we communicate to the parents. And we show them how rubrics are made, references, uh, student-led conferences, and the different ways in using like visible thinking routines. These are all different ways in which the child is able to showcase their learning. And as long as a child is able to showcase their learning and connect, make the other person understand of how the metacognition that is happening, I think it's enough in the primary years and middle years to uh, assess the progress of a child. Because over a period of time, you do collect a portfolio of, uh, you know, of thoughts and of the way the child's learning and critical thinking and analytical skills have improved over a period of time. So uh, I think using rubrics, uh, having the conferences, showcasing their learning, giving them a chance to exhibit their projects and talk about what went behind it and how they were uh, doing it. Let the children talk about the process of uh, learning and what they have learned over a period of time. I think uh, uh, it's about changing mindsets about assessment. And once you do that, there are many different ways to uh, exhibit and showcase the progress and development of learning. So Love rubrics, it. visible thinking routines, conferences, student-led conferences, exhibitions, these are all different ways in which uh, learning can be assessed and evaluated and, and tracked over a period of time. Love. Uh, Farzana, I would love to hear from you of how you are incorporating, you know, all these practices like uh, design thinking or other innovation tools, techniques, uh, you know, within the framework and making it come alive. Uh, the NEP is a very visionary document and it tells us about the five guiding pillars, access, uh, quality, equity, affordability and accountability. So what we do in our teacher training is always have these five pillars. It's like a part of every teacher training. Whatever you plan to do, are you covering these five pillars or not? Okay. So we do a lot of intensive teacher training for our, our teachers. Uh, for example, um, an innovative way that we do, because I truly believe as an educator, play is the best way to learn. 
And unfortunately, in the early years, there is play, but as soon as they come into paper, that's the primary years, play becomes like, okay, one class in the timetable. So what we had done is we brought in a lot of Lego learning in our classrooms. They enjoy playing with Legos and their creativity comes about, their learning. So whether it's a math skill or a science skill or even a, a, a negotiation in a group, all of it are skill sets which they learn in Lego learning. And I, I always feel NEP is not telling us to chuck everything that was old and bring everything that is new. It's an amalgamation. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a combination. So for us, Vedic maths is very important because they teach you the tricks and tricks of how to, uh, you know, maneuver because there are some children who don't like maths. But as soon as we don't say it's Vedic maths, but when we teach them some tricks and they say, oh, and they look up in awe and say, yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm interested. So it, this is an innovative way of getting the children to focus on a subject which they don't know. Another thing which we do very much in our schools is a maker space. That's the design thinking thing. Uh, it's sort of very expensive. Every school can have a maker space. And what do we have in a maker space? You need a room. And this is where, as Sir said, we take a lot of help from our parents and our wider community. And we ask them to send us everything that they do not need at home and which is nice and clean to send us to our maker school studios. And then the children use all those waste materials, recycle them, like you gave that example of bar. We also do alternate uh, thinking uh, theme. And that's when we tell them, use this and create. So if I have got a tissue paper roll, that's actually for tissue paper. Now we're going to create something else. And I'll tell you, friends, the children are so, they are actually born design thinkers, but unfortunately, our systems curb them. So this is a period where they love to go and they're free to explore. And I, that's why I think of a maker space is very essential. And other thing which we have done in our middle school is introduce the uh, entrepreneurship curriculum. Because we feel we have to create the entrepreneurs and innovators. If we don't have that type of a curriculum, it's very difficult to uh, to motivate the kids to look. Now, how do we assess it? I Okay, I teach about entrepreneurship. That's quite a dry topic. But how do I assess it? We assess it by doing a market day. So they learn about a product, mm -hmm. design, costing, and then they create the product, and then the parents come. And as Jasmeet Sara said, yes, parents are very important in this process. They come. And they are, uh, they talk about their product and they sell their profit, profit loss to so their learning maths. So all the transdisciplinary learning comes in and it is assessed through the market. Day. We have something else which we call as pitch perfect or we can, you know, the sharp tank. Yeah. Everybody watches sharp tank. So we do something similar with, the, uh, with our curriculum and we get our children to plan and they come and pitch me. It actually invite three, four parents who are, uh, you know, into different industries, bankers, and they become a panel and the children come and they pitch their products. And it has been an extremely, extremely excellent experience. I would recommend everybody who's watching this show to try this because this assesses all their skills of communication, analysis, profit and loss, you know, everything. So it's truly transdisciplinary learning. And um, we have something called the Edu Carnival. So what do we do in that? All the learning that has happened, and because we're talking about assessment, but different ways of assessing. In this Edu Carnival, our children present what they have learned. And the parents are then uh, having the rubrics, as Asma said, and they assess the children of how well they explain a concept that they've understood and how they put it into a practical way. It's a fun thing. It's a carnival. There is lots of gaming and lots of fun thing. But every game is not bought. It is made by the children based on a concept that they have learned in math or science or English. So over to you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all those best practices. I truly believe um, student-led conferences, projects, shark tanks, or other experiences can uh, really be uh, a great way to 
uh, bring it into this play, learning plus innovation. And then, of course, uh, make children realize that all of them can be put together to add value in the real world. Uh, they become meaningful and the whole system of content-based goes to actually context-based education, which is so important uh, in the future. And it's beginning today. So uh, I'd like to ask some specific questions to each one of you before we uh, go ahead to some more generic topics. Um, and I'll begin with maybe uh, Jasveer sir, because uh, he's been leading uh, Macrovision Academy, which uh, we've been working with for many years on through the Innovator uh, Challenge, uh, the Trailblazer Fellowship and other initiatives. So I would like to understand, sir, from you, the impact of such um, programs, platforms, where which you know celebrate and talk about innovation and uh, change making for children. What is the impact that such initiatives and others like these can have on children's perspective and their you know uh, perspective and their skill set? Uh, okay. I think um, almost seven eight years back we associated with uh, InnoVenture, and when we got the proposal from uh, your side. And when we just informed to the students, the students were somewhat reluctant. They were not uh, exactly uh, ready to participate in that. Well, it was very difficult for us to motivate the students to go for uh, this one because for us also it was a new thing, and for the definitely for the students also. But today I can say definitely the credit goes to your team and Innovation Intelligence Plus. And the students now they come to us, they approach us, and they say, "Sir, when uh, when the registration process will start." Definitely, it has a greater, greater uh, impact on the students. They have started thinking, they have started discussion, they have started thinking about the problems and how to so, uh, what uh, how to take the solution or whatever the solution could be for a particular type of the pro problem because they know that they have to appear, they have to just participate in that particular activity, uh, the intelligence plus which uh, they take it. You must be knowing about the Avik uh, Jox, uh, Joxia also. And yeah got all those medals, trophies and all. He just presented the things in the assembly. That has motivated the other students also. Now everyone, everyone, they just wanted to, yes, I should be the part of uh, this one. They are coming up. They are coming up with that one. And that only by seeing the craze among the students. Uh, in the month of January, January 11th and 12th, January 2025, uh, we are having um, that uh, uh, Bharat Science Tech uh, Techno Fest we are having. Uh, it is the uh, organized by the Raman Science and Technology mm -hmm. Foundation and uh, National Council of Teacher Scientists and APJ Abdul Kalam National Council of uh, Young Scientists. So they, uh, it's a national uh, event which we are organizing it again just to promote the things and to showcase whatever our students are doing it and uh, what they are thinking. So we will be showcasing that one and even the students from the different parts of the country, they will be the part of... Uh, uh, this one, I would like to extend the invitation to all the panelists uh, also to visit uh, uh, this one. And uh, yes, of course, it's a it's a very good platform. I must say, it's not like that. Okay, I'm the one of the panelists, so that's why I'm saying. But really, it's a very good uh, uh, platform for the students to develop their creativity, and especially when the students when they attend the Pune even in the month of uh, January, and when they come up, they just say, "Sir, it's wonderful." Okay. For two, three days, they simply they talk about that event and they talk about it, what they have learned uh, there. And this is this is the impact what I feel that is uh, there. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing all these kind words. Uh, it's wonderful to see that children are going beyond the typical academic and are wanting to apply themselves and think of themselves that, that it's possible that I can also be an innovative thinker. I think that for me is the biggest win. That yes. children see that yes. shift in themselves from, uh, you know, can I to I can, which is uh, the real shift uh, as innovators. So uh, to Farzana, ma'am, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and, you know, we spoke about briefly and touched upon the role of teachers and how it's important that you stressed upon. So how do you ensure that teachers are also equipped with necessary innovation tools and techniques, not just pedagogies? to effectively implement these tools and frameworks in the classroom. How do you make this as a process, uh, you know, and or how would you recommend that they be, schools go ahead? So uh, let's ask ourselves, what, what are these innovation skills that we want our teachers or our students to sort of develop? They are actually the abilities that will enable people 
students, teachers to develop innovative solutions for complex problems. That's exactly the key. So every time, is there a solution for a problem? As you said, when you brought that walker, then they started thinking, you know. So what is the innovative solution to a problem? And then there are various ways that they can do it. And one thing which I always tell teachers in any workshop is change is inevitable. Accept it, embrace it. Like when COVID hit us, you know, some of the senior teachers found it very difficult to use technology, but they had to. And today all are very comfortable with it. So when it falls into your lap, you automatically start using it. So uh, one thing which is always uh, in my mind, and that is to teach is to learn twice. It's a Joseph Jubert quote, which I'm using. And so in our workshops, in our trainings, in our professional development days, we spend a lot of time to tell teachers you are learning from cradle to grade. It is not enough to say, oh, I've got a BA or I've got an MA or an MSc and I, I know it all. Or I've worked in five schools and, you know, whatever. Each day could be a learning day for the teacher. Okay, that's when they can become an innovator and usher in innovation. So we do many things. One is, of course, the, the teacher training I spoke about. We also do teacher mentorship. Now, what do you mean by teacher mentorship? Is Because we have a chain of schools. We know that in every school, we have two, three leading, very good teachers who've been with us with the system and have produced good results also. We get them to mentor all the younger ones who come in to sort of handhold them. Mm. We have another thing which happens in our class, in our individual schools, and we call it the butterfly effect. So what is the butterfly effect? We get our teachers, like if I take primary, so if I take one and two, they go to watch one another's class and learn from one another. So they actually go and the timetable is made in such a way that they are able to enter one another's class. And this is a free, and if there is nothing that, oh, she's coming to watch me. So it's a very open uh, session where everybody is learning. Uh, we also invite, um, you know, specialists, as I told you, for like for the pitch perfect and all. And they come and do a lot of training with our teachers to organize such innovative programs and also for us too. That's teacher training. Now, class observations, many times schools use it more for their appraisal group. And that's something which I have said at the mm -hmm. We don't use observation software. That's not linked at all for us. What we do, we tell the teacher it is for your personal and professional group. And then they're very open about it. And they're, open, they're willing to open their classrooms and you come and offer. We have uh, things called uh, expert classes. So we have um, specialists across our, our chain of school, very good with maths, who is helping all the maths teachers. Mm -hmm. And that we call as expert classes. We have master classes. And what is master classes is we get someone from outside to do sessions with our children. And uh, we most of the time do it on a Zoom platform. And because we have more than 15,000 students and we select segments of children, who will be able to attend and learn from. Uh, we also do uh, sessions like um, we did a learning festival, a week-long learning festival, where we invite people, again, it's an online thing. There is nobody has to get to just give one hour of it. Train the trainer moments is what we call. Of course, I did speak about the maker spaces uh, already yeah. earlier. So we do a lot of all these things for brainstorming, ideation, bringing in innovation. It is very important. Each day is a learning day. Please, I would join my hands and tell every teacher watching this show, remember, we are learning every day. I am learning every day after so many years. I think I picked up some cool ideas from Asma and just be so. And of course, from you. So we have to keep learning and innovating. Thank you. Absolutely. I think uh, the, all the examples you've shared and the spirit of an educator is, uh, you know, to keep learning, to be the lifelong learner themselves. And if we do that and keep innovating and reinventing ourselves, I think we can then pass on that same spirit to our kids. 
so Asma ma'am, we'd love to have you answer, you know, since you work with a lot of parents as well to your initiative. So how can we support parents? And uh, I'm saying this from a perspective that, you know, we're talking about innovation skill sets. Uh, we're talking about innovation uh, frameworks. Uh, and a large part of India and the Indian, you know, community demographics, uh, this awareness hasn't reached. I'm not just talking about the upper and the higher middle class, yeah. but so how do we support parents at all levels, right? Um, right from the top to the bottom of the chain. Um, maybe, you know, if you could share, how can, we, how can parents support their children to developing that innovation mindset at home? They all understand that uh, academics ke bahar bhi kuch karna hai, but uh, the question I think has been twofold. I've been a mother myself. So how do we help them realign priorities and parenting perspectives to prioritize innovation skills? That is one part. And second, um, how do we support them so that they can do, you know, or cultivate this further at home? And I think that just reinforces what the school will try to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. I think it's very, very important. And uh, so uh, I think the first we start with parent orientations. I think it's very important that if you are having innovative pedagogies in your school and you're doing something different, uh, and what kind of uh, clientele do you have that you cater to? Where Where is your school located? What kind of a mindset do the parents have? So I think the first thing that I do generally uh, when I do consultations in school and when I work with different schools is that we have to take the parents on board with what we are doing. So they have to be on the same wavelength and they have to understand and trust the educators with things that we are doing differently. So if you're doing things differently, parents have to be on board. So the first thing that you do is bring them on board, share your ideas, tell them how, how learning is going to happen and what's going to happen. And you really, the parents, uh, and then we do give the parents a few tips uh, during the orientation programs. So I think it's very important that the parents uh, allow their children to make mistakes. I think instead of, uh, you know, the perfection ka mindset, that the parents tend to have, like nothing is short of perfect, like it, everything has, that puts a lot of pressure on, on the children. So I, when we are asking the children in school that it's okay to make a mistake and that's how you learn, I think that the mindset has to be shared with the parents as well so that they allow the children to make mistakes and allow them to experiment and move. I think parents also need to support children by giving them time to, um, uh, you know, it cannot be jaldi, jaldi, jaldi. It's time for time for thinking, time, the space and the opportunity also. Like uh, not just the time, but also the space, the opportunity to learn, to invent, to collaborate, to come together, to go to different people's houses, like, you know, to provide the resources for doing things. Uh, and also, um, I think it's really important um, uh, 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 even if I give my own example, not like a, my mom was not very fluent with English. She was a teacher, but she was an Urdu teacher. So she was not very fluent with English. So, but I, she was always there to listen to us, to listen to our ideas. I know I made some like, I'm telling about my own childhood. I used to make some like, random machines and things in my balcony and try to be innovative and do experiments. <laughs> but my parents always like allowed allowed me to do it. Even though the ideas were sometimes, I remember making a lemonade machine and uh, I spent so much time on it. And, you know, I, you know, and when I showed it to my mom and my mom was like, why can't we just squeeze the lemon? <laughs> 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 So the thing is that I think it's very important for parents to have that big talk with the children, uh, to have that conversation where they listen to the children's ideas and where they, uh, you know, uh, discuss and hear what the ch child is trying to say and what their idea is about. And that's one of the, I think it's a very crucial way to support your child is to listen to them. And uh, so what we do in school is we call it the big talk. 
where you go home and you share your ideas with your parents, what you want to do, how you want to do it. And even if the parents are not giving a lot of input, they can listen. And I think that brainstorming really helps to uh, give clarity to the idea. So uh, giving children the, also giving children the opportunity for exposure and mm. uh, uh, and different kinds of experiences, I think that also makes a huge difference. I think parents have stopped taking the children to the museums. They've stopped. Uh, I think it's all about malls and you know play zones. Um, I think parents have stopped going to museums by the sea, to the rivers, to experience nature as a family. School se to jate hai as a field trip, but like as a family, you've stopped doing those things. So I think traveling, however possible, even if it's in the train, like, you know, or by a bus, that doesn't matter. But traveling as a family, like sharing those experiences, learning from those experiences, giving children the time, allowing them to make mistakes having that big talk with the children. I think these are all little things that parents can do to support big innovative ideas that are happening in school. Because I think this is what makes the foundation for developing a high self-esteem, giving them the confidence that it's okay to move on and to try something new and to have big ideas. So uh, that kind of support at home really makes a huge difference. I know it did to me. And uh, I've tried to do the same for my own children. And uh, I've tried to replicate it uh, in, in the classrooms and schools that I work with. And uh, so far, I think uh, the parents also kind of grow with the children. Yes. So it, it allows the parent to grow uh, and to be a part of the journey. So I think that kind of interaction uh, by bringing them on board allows the parents to be a part of the journey and it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for highlighting the importance of access to resources and material, opportunities for exposure, and of course the freedom to, and the space to just be and innovate and listen to those big ideas. Uh, and I'd like just to add from my personal experience since you shared yours, I also had developed this habit of I think asking the right kind of questions to our kids so that they yeah. allow them to think. Because very Absolutely. often when we see something, uh, we also kind of tend to be cynical and crib about it. But then I, I've got this, this habit to do it with my daughters. Um, how can we make this better? You know, how can you, what can we do? How can we change this? Yeah. So rather than them saying we're playing the victim card, if they have to be really responsible citizens, innovators, I think when we ask them the bigger questions of, what can we do differently? We are automatically opening up their mind to open-ended ideas and possibilities. And I think that's also, you know, can beautifully work for children. So uh, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I've got to hear some amazing insights of... Uh, one of the biggest learnings right. for me as a... Sorry, I was just Thank saying you. that as a parent, one of my biggest learnings was to retain... Oh. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, I think one of, the biggest learning, one of the biggest learning for me as a parent was to refrain myself from giving the solution. Mm. I think, you know, I had to stop myself every time and say, let her think, <laughs> like, you know, yes. uh, let her come up with a solution. Maybe it's going to be something better. So I think initially when you are a new parent, you tend to, you tend to speed things up and you tend to like jump in and give your ideas. And, uh, but I think this is one of the things that I've learned in my journey is to refrain myself and hold myself back and allow, uh, allow my child, my daughter to have that space to think and come up with solutions on their own and try and experiment it and see whether it works or it doesn't work instead of saying that this is going to work and this is not going to work. Sometimes parents think that they are counseling and they are, you know, they're they're sharing their wisdom. But uh, it, it's good to reframe yourself from and hold yourself back and allow the child to make that mistake. And I think it's very, very important for children to have grit and perseverance. Uh, when you talk of innovative pedagogy, when you're talking of experiential learning and project-based learning, uh, everything is not flowery and beautiful. And everything is not like, it doesn't turn out the way you expect it to. So often there are failures and there are imperfections and it's okay. 
uh, I think one of the biggest lessons that these uh, pedagogies help us to, when you're integrating pedagogies and talking of innovation, I think one of the biggest lessons that you learn from them is uh, to move on after you've stumbled down. So it can turn out to be a big mess, uh, but how do you move on from that? I think that's one of the big lessons in life that you learn through. This, these kind of innovations give you that space that allow you to make mistakes and move on. And that's very, very important in a child's journey of life. Absolutely. Just to add to what Asma said, she was asked, talking about herself as a parent and keeping herself away from giving, providing the answer. Super. Uh, I would also say teachers need to give that wait time. They ask a question yes. and immediately they want an answer. And if they don't respond, they don't give them time. They're young minds, they need time. So the same response time should be told even to our teachers. And one other thing which she talked about the mess is the process is more important than the product. That's so important. That's every time we keep saying and hampering even in not only our children, but even our teachers. Because you have some teachers who like the finished product. And I would not give it the full marks. But the messy product, because the process and they explained, we failed and then we did this. That's important. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We've heard some amazing insights uh, from, a, from, from an educator's perspective, from parents' perspective, from a school ecosystem of what it takes. Uh, yes, we, sir, thank you so much for sharing so many insights from your school. Uh, Prasanna, ma'am, for all the insights, uh, including the best practices that you're managing as a group of schools. Uh, that can be really helpful to you know, all the other schools and of course Asma ma'am your perspective of dealing with parents and children uh, to you know, connect all the discussion and the dots together. Thank you so much. I'm sure it's been extremely uh, worthwhile and fruitful for all those joining us today. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. You. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pranjal, Ms. Farzana, Ms. Asma, and Mr. Zavir for your invaluable insights during the panel discussion. We exceed our sincere gratitude to all the participants who joined us today. Please stay tuned for the future engaging discussions. Thank you. Thank you.